Many viewers have requested that I do a video on Riesling. And this week I'm in New York, and one of the people that I know who's most knowledgeable about Riesling is Lyle Fass of Fass Selections. And Lyle has graciously agreed to help me out on this German Riesling deep dive. Fast Selections is a direct-to-consumer retailer, and Lyle has more than 20 years of experience in the retail business. He's forgotten more about Riesling than most people will ever know, and so he's the perfect person to help me out with this video. Lyle, thanks very much for joining me today. It's a pleasure to uh, join you into this deep dive about Riesling, because I think one of my three favorite things to do in life is speak about German Riesling. There is so much to speak about. It's so versatile. It has a long, long history. And I may be biased, but it's the greatest wine grape in the world. So today we're going to start out by talking about Riesling and some of its characteristics. And then we'll get into the different expressions of Riesling. After that, we will get into some of the different German wine producing regions that are well known for Riesling. And we're even going to do a little bit of tasting as we go. After that, we'll discuss the German requirements and some of the different categories of German Riesling. So we should have a great episode for you today. While Riesling does well in many other countries, including Austria, parts of Australia, and certainly Alsace, France, Germany is certainly the largest producer of Riesling, and 23% of production of wine in Germany is for Riesling. Germany is well suited to Riesling because it's a grape that can survive the cold winters in Germany, Riesling is an extremely high acid grape, it has high sugar content, and it definitely has pronounced aromatic intensity and flavor intensity. When you get a top expression of Riesling, it can overwhelm your senses like few wines can. There's a wide variety of different descriptors that you can get in Riesling, and we'll touch on that as we're going through the tasting. But one thing that I hear frequently from viewers and from other people that I interact with about Riesling is that they just say that they don't like it because they don't like sweet wines and they assume that all Riesling is sweet. Lyle, what can you tell people about the different expressions of Riesling? I like to debunk kind of a lot of wine mythology and the biggest myth in German wine by far is that Riesling is sweet. You can substitute is with can and then you're definitely on the right track there. Riesling can be sweet, but it also can be dry and it also can be in between. The French have a word for it, which no one seems to be praised out by, demisec. The, reason the Germans have a word for it, too. They used to have a word for it called Halbtrocken, but that word went out of fashion, so they created a brand new word that sounds better to the ears called Feinherd. But one of the most important things about German Riesling that people need to understand in order to grasp it and appreciate it is the difference between ripeness and sweetness. Those are two different words that mean two different completely different things, excuse me. And ripeness is basically, you know, if you have the grapes on the vine and you wait week after week, they're going to get riper. They're going to get riper and they're going to get riper. Are they going to get sweeter? They can, but they don't necessarily, it doesn't necessarily have to happen because we need to remember what is kind of alcohol and how does alcohol work? Alcohol is the fermentation of sugar into alcohol. It's a process. That's what fermentation is. You take the sugar from the grape and you let it ferment, however you, you're going to do it, and then it transfers to alcohol. But if you stop the fermentation before it's fully fermented and the sugar is transferred to alcohol, what's going to happen? There's going to be sugar left in the wine, and the Germans are experts at that. And if you let the fermentation finish completely and all the sugar uh, has been fermented into alcohol, the wine is going to be dry. Yet, it can still be exceptionally ripe. And another thing, another question that people ask me is, how can you have an Auslase Atrokin or a Spätlase Atrokin or a Cabinet Atrokin? Because those words contradict each other. And no, those words complement each other. Cabinet is a reference to ripeness. Atrokin is a reference to sweetness. Auslase is ripeness. And Auslase, and Auslase Atrokin means fully ripe three, four weeks after the cabinet is picked, and then trocken, which means it's been fermented completely dry. So, I mean, I've even seen in Germany Baron Auschlese trocken, and it can happen. I've seen ice wine trocken. I haven't seen TBA trocken, because that definitely probably doesn't exist. Uh, but that's the number one thing. All German Riesling is not sweet, but it can be sweet, and most German Riesling 
is dry. And in addition to dry and sweet Riesling, or Riesling with some residual sugar, there's also a number of excellent expressions of sparkling Riesling. What can you tell people about sparkling Riesling and producers such as Romland, for example? So German Sekt, which is the name of German sparkling wine, particularly uh, German sparkling Riesling. Sekt House Romland, who is the producer who's in Florsheim, Dalsheim, which is right down the block from Klaus Peter Keller, he is very famous for his sparkling Riesling, but he's actually more famous for his champagne sparkling varietals. Uh, but a good sect can mimic champagne, toastiness, breadiness, yeastiness, but it still has that kind of extra German engineering and precision. Um, and I mean, I think it is one of the most exciting categories in German wine. And now we're ready to discuss the different wine producing regions in Germany that are known for producing high quality Riesling. These regions share a number of characteristics. Historically, they've certainly had marginal, cool continental climates. For that reason, site selection is typically quite important. In most of the regions, you'll find some of the best vineyard locations located near rivers. These rivers are important because they provide moderating influences to the temperature, and they also help to radiate some of the sunlight and heat from the river to the vineyards. In addition, you'll find that many of these vineyards are located on slopes, particularly slopes that are south-facing, which helps to ensure that the grapes achieve ripeness. And also many of the vineyards have rocky or slate soils, and these rocky and slate soils also help to absorb heat and sunlight throughout the day and radiate that heat back to the vineyards at night, which further assists with ripening. We're gonna start out talking about Faltz. Faltz is a region that's known for producing high quality German Riesling. Faltz is a narrow strip of vineyards that has the Hart Mountains to the west, and the Rhine Plain to the east. Unusually for German wine producing regions, Faltz is not located near a river. Rather, it's located in the foothills of the Hart Mountains, which are basically a continuation of the Vosges Mountains from Alsace, France. As such, there's a rain shadow effect that comes from the Hart Mountains, and so Faltz is actually one of the most dry regions for producing wine in all of Germany. Accordingly, it's one of the regions where you actually have a concern with the drought in some vintages. If you're talking about the spectrum of low alcohol by volume to high alcohol by volume in terms of German wine producing regions for Riesling, you'll have Mosul, which has the lowest alcohol by volume on one extreme. And then at the very high end, you'll have Faltz, which is known for producing Riesling with higher alcohol by volume than most of the other German producing regions. I love the Falls. I've been a huge fan of it for a long time. I think it's one of the first German wine regions that I fell in love with that was not the Mosul. For me, the undisputed qualitative leader of the Falls has to be Dr. Berthen Wolf. And they have this amazing new winemaker in the last four or five years and some of the most incredible sites out there. And it's just, you know, just every wine is incredible, especially their, you know, Grand Cru's. Uh, that they make, Kirchenstück and Pechstein, uh, you know, I'd say are the tops, but you also have Longen Morgan, Hohen Morgan, and so many other different Grand Cru sites, and they are just spectacular, spectacular wines, precise, chiseled, deep, just perfect, purity, everything, I mean, they are the tops. And then, I would say, a close second, you have Reb Holes, Ocano Mariach Reb Holes, uh, who is in Berkweil, and his famous site is Kastanian Bush, and he makes absolutely astonishing wine from Kastanian Bush. Uh, but these wines demand age, especially I think all the wines kind of from this area uh, de demand age, uh, the, the Berkweil uh, area. And then you also have a new producer that I just picked up last year called Dr. Warheim. He's also making Kastanian Bush as well, Kastanian Bush Riesling. Kastanian Bush also is really good for Pinot. Um, and these are just beautiful, beautiful wines. There's lots of citrus to it, uh, lots of kind of, you know, tangerine, tangelo, peach. That's kind of like the fruits that you're getting uh, in, in the vaults. Uh, but you also have this just backbone of intense minerality and huge high acidity. You cannot go wrong with Brooklyn Wolf, Dr. Warheim, Christamon, um, Reb Holes. Those are definitely uh, my top four. Now we've come to the fun part. We're going to taste the wines. So now we're going to start by tasting our German Riesling from Faltz. 
glass. I got some wine in the glass. It's Riesling. The color should potentially be a giveaway where we are. This is definitely from a southern region. And this is a wine that I love. It's one of my favorite wines in all of Germany. You probably can't see this because it's backwards, but it's a Christmann Konigsbach Ittig Grossgerbach Riesling 2021. And Christmann is a producer that German wine aficionados really know well. He may not be the most famous in the vaults, something like Broken Wolf or Red Holes. This is an insider's wine. It really is an insider's wine. Uh, and Ittig, and it's funny that the Konigsbach Ittig is a site that's actually even more famous for Spaferbender than it is, which is German Pinot Noir, uh, than it is for Riesling. Uh, but I buy this wine from my cellar personally every year. I don't import this wine or anything like that, and I adore it. It has a level uh, of nimbleness and class and precision that I get out of a producer we sell in Burgundy called Riese, uh, for example. Um, or Keller or Schaefer Prolic or something like that. I mean, it is just beautiful. I'll just give a little brief tasting note. Um, when we opened it, it was slightly reduced. And here's a little wine trick. If you open a wine that's slightly reduced, get your glass, put your palm over the glass, just like this, and the reduction should go away after doing this maybe two or three times. Beautiful, airy, citrus, pink grapefruit, tangerine, tangelo, peach. Uh, that's kind of your typical fault flavor profile here. But you also have this kind of like sea airiness and then something that I call like a sea in nature. And this wine has been open for maybe 30 or 45 minutes and it's evolved dramatically in the glass. When we first opened it, there was some reduction, but that's completely blown off. And the aromatics are definitely coming out now, and it's much more expressive than when we first opened it. So don't be shy about giving your German Rieslings lots of air. And I certainly decant them in many instances as well. Yeah, and this is, uh, 21 is just one of the most amazing vintages. It has high acidity. It has low to normal alcohol. Unbelievable concentration. Superb complexity. Almost a tannic-like grip on the finish. You have pitter patters of fruit on the palate. I'm definitely getting pink grapefruit, some citrus, barely ripe peach. I mean, 2021 is a vintage where the fruit is just ripe. If you're interested in wine recommendations, wine collecting strategies, and learning more about wine, please do subscribe to my channel. I've been collecting wine for more than 15 years and also have a level four diploma from the WSET. So I have both formal certification as well as substantial practical knowledge from the School of Hard Knocks. Now we've come to the Mosul. The Mosul is one of the most northerly wine producing regions in Germany. As such, it tends to have a very cool climate. And if we're talking about the alcohol by volume spectrum, you would have faults at the highest end and you'll have Mosul at the lowest. And it's not uncommon for uh, German Rieslings from the Mosul to have only 7 or 8% alcohol by volume, for example. The Mosul is divided into the upper, middle, and lower regions, and the middle is where you find most of the highest quality vineyards. The Mosul is dominated by white wine. 90% of the plantings in Mosul are white wine, and about two-thirds of those plantings are dedicated to Riesling. There's certainly also a number of very famous vineyards located in the Mosul. Lyle, what are some of the most famous vineyards in the Mosul area, and what can you tell us about those? There are so many famous vineyards in the Mosul, uh, and obviously the most famous vineyards are in the Middle Mosul. I'll quickly just briefly go over them. In Brownburg, you've got Wilfer, Wilfer Sonneter. Uh, in Eredin, you have Trepschen and Prelot. Uh, in Brock, you have Himmelreich and Domprost. In Erzik, you have Berlsgarten. In Valen, you have Sonneter. Uh, I will add also there is Zeltingen. Uh, and in Zeltingen, you have the Zeltinger Sonneter which arguably today, because of climate change, possibly is making better wines than the Wailinger Sonnener, and you also have the Zeltinger Schlossberg, which is another very, very remarkable vineyard. And then in Baron Castle, you have the Doctor, that's called Doctor, because a long time ago, people thought the vineyard had healing qualities. Um, and in Peaceport, you have Gold Traction, but it might be mentioned that you also have other vineyards in Peaceport, like in Peaceport, like Treption, like Domherr, and like Rothenburg, which are increasingly high quality due to climate change and global warming. But also there's an area called Traven Charbach, 
Planet of Leisure I work with Martin Mullen uh, has, and he has the Tribot the Hummingbird, which he single-handedly replanted. And let me tell you, replanting a German vineyard is the most impossible work in the world. They're steep, and you know, removing these bushes and these trees and planting vines, oh, it is horrible, back-breaking work. So Mullen replanted the entire Hummingbird, and that's his grapes we get now. But there's also he also is making incredible wines in villages that maybe you haven't heard of, like Prove, the Prover Letterlie, the Prover Paradis, um, the Prover Steffensburg, for example. So there are all types of vineyards and all these kind of nooks and valleys now of the Mosel that are becoming recognition. Stefan Steinmetz again, he's got the Zorner Grosser Hengelberg, he's got New Magener Rosengarten. You know, he's got Winterthur Geiersleit, which is right next to Peaceport. And, you know, all of these vineyards were barely ripening maybe 20, 30, 40 years ago. German Rieslings from the Mosel tend to be lighter in color, lighter in body, and with higher acid than German Rieslings from other regions. You can see compared to the false wine that we had a little bit earlier, this wine is definitely lighter in color. There definitely is higher acid, and there's pronounced flavor and aromatic intensity as well. And the combination of pronounced intensity on the palate plus high acid means that these can be some very long-lived wines that can age effortlessly for decades. The Mosel tends to be known for wines with residual sugar, but they're increasingly making dry styles as well. The next region we're going to be discussing is the Rheingau. The Rheingau is only about 45 minutes from Frankfurt, so if you're ever in Frankfurt, it's an easy visit. The Rheingau is a small but prestigious region that's known for producing very high quality Riesling. The Rhine River is particularly wide here and has a moderating influence on temperatures. The Rheinhessen is across the river, so this is a region where there's a number of high quality producers, and due to the slightly warmer conditions here, you'll also find Riesling that has slightly more alcohol by volume, certainly than the Mosel, which is maybe an hour, hour and a half away from the Rheingau. 86% of plantings are for white wine, and around 78% of total plantings are Riesling. The Rheingau has many, many elite vineyards. Um, they are situated on the steep slopes of Rudersheim, with Rudersheimer Berg Schlossberg and Rudersheimer Berg Rotland being two of the most famous. And then Geisenheim, you have the Geisenheimer Rotzenberg uh, as well. Uh, Johannesburg, which is a kind of monopole of the Schloss Johannesburg, which for me is probably the greatest estate, uh, all of uh, the Rheingau, and they have little kind of micro sections, Silverlock, Grimlock, et cetera, of the Schloss Johannesburg. And then you have Hattenheim, shout out to the Schloss Adler, uh, which is one of the greatest wine restaurants in all of Germany. Um, and you have many good sites in Hattenheim, and also Erbach, especially the most famous one being the Erbach Market Room. They have lots of great producers in the Rheingau, but they've changed over history. Back in the day, the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, you had the Schlosses, Schloss Volrad, Schloss Ryan Hartson, Schloss Johannesburg, and they were owned by aristocrats and kind of, you know, made Germany's reputation in the world for Riesling. Uh, but then they started to rest on their laurels and it became kind of not as good, you know, they were just going through the motions. And then there was kind of a rebirth. And now Schloss Johannesburg is arguably one of the best producers in all the Rheingau. I'd say right up there, the best kind of indie producer is Peter Jacob Kuhn. Uh, his famous site is the Ostrister Duisburg, uh, and he is amazing biodynamic organic, and it is very hard to be biodynamic in Germany. And, you know, I also need to mention uh, Osmannhausen, which is a village uh, where August Kessler is uh, making wine, and Kessler is considered the father of Rheingau Pinot Noir. I've never personally cared for the wines. Uh, they command very huge prices. They are incredibly popular in Germany, but he also makes some really good sweet wines, Pratikot wines out of uh, Rudersheim, which I really, really like. You know, one other thing about the Rheingau, for me, the distinguishing characteristic of these wines is I find them to be effortlessly elegant. There is a fineness and elegance to top Rheingau wines that is just unmistakable. And there is a fierce, intense minerality, but it always is nimble and is always just kind of a serene zen. Top Rheingau wines remind me kind of of like a zen, zenness they have to them. 
Uh, you know, there's just not one part out of place. You know, uh, it's not about, you know, you, you, the sum of the parts is basically much more important than each part, uh, I would say. And uh, the Rhine Gau is, you know, on, on its way, I'd say. And uh, you also have, you know, there's distinctive areas as well. Another producer that I should mention I forgot is Franz Kunstler. Uh, and they're making absolutely astonishing wines from Holheim. Uh, is one of their great sites, Holheimer Hole. They do a Dr. Marco Bloom as well. And they do Holheimer Kirchen stuff, Basel Kirchen stuff from almost every wine uh, region in Germany uh, as well. And that's the Rheingau.